Another problem that happens with chainsaws, of course, is the starter. The starters are always manual. You yank on these things <clears throat> and they spin the motor. So I just yank on it like that, it spins the motor, and whoops, doesn't go back. <laughs> Darn. So if you find yourself <clears throat> with a starter cord that comes, uh, does not go back in, it's because the uh, spring <clears throat> has broken. And <clears throat> this is a typical spring of uh, older chainsaws. It's like the spring in a watch. So <clears throat> you take this off. It takes very few tools to fix a chainsaw. A screwdriver is one of them. Fingers are another. So on this saw, <clears throat> the starter comes right off in 10 seconds. You have it here in your hand. <clears throat> and <clears throat> it could be that the cord broke, and it's just here in the air. The reason that it broke, of course, is again, what? Your fault, right? It broke because when you pulled it, you pulled it all the way, and the knot at the end of the rope got <clears throat> cinched against a metal edge. So every time you do that, you cut the cord a little bit more, and then it flies off into the air. So the first time you buy the chainsaw, pull it slowly all the way, and then never pull it that far again. The, the saw does not benefit from long pulls, so short pulls. The other thing that I see people doing, very insensitive, is that they yank the cord, this kind of thing. <clears throat> the centrifugal force of that turning sends some teeth into a drum that grab it to, pull, to turn the motor. So if you yank it, they gouge into it. And, or the pawls that hold the teeth that go in get bent. So you're ruining the starter. So you should always pull gently until you feel the, the hole and then pull the rest of the way. <clears throat> so you get it, get it to engage and then pull, engage and then pull. <clears throat> and that will save the starter. The spring is quite a challenge to replace. So you'd like the spring not to uh, fall apart. What makes a spring fall apart is moisture. If water gets into the starter area, <clears throat> this steel of a spring uh, is not protected by paint. And so the slightest bit of pitting on it will make it crack there. And getting a spring back into place is a real challenge. I get this thing in about three quarters of the way, and it shoots up in the air, and I have to start all over again. So at the dealer, you would say, I'd like to know how the spring is. And modern springs often today come in a plastic cartridge. So you just have the cartridge and you drop it in <clears throat> and you're all set. So then what you do is you simply wind up <clears throat> the starter, <clears throat> use your thumb to keep it from bouncing back, get it all the way up, and then you push the string back through the hole, make a new knot, hook it into the starter, and then take your thumbs off and let it go and the spring will wind the cord all the way back into place. So this uh, happened to me a dozen times over the years, right there in the woods. It just takes two minutes <clears throat> to get the cord uh, back and running. All right, so <clears throat> we've taken care of the cord, we've taken care of the spark plug, we've mixed uh, fuel, and uh, let's say that the thing still won't start. <clears throat> to get the saw to start, there is a trigger that gives more or less fuel, and there's also a choke. Now, when the little rubber diaphragm in the motor is moving back and forth a sixteenth of an inch, every time it moves a sixteenth, it sucks fuel up that line that we looked at. So on this saw, I have to pull this thing sixteen times before the fuel makes it from the tank all the way to the carburetor. Once it's there, though, for the rest of the day, it starts on the first pull. So every saw has a, a certain uh, <clears throat> pumping that has to take place. I'd recommend that you buy a saw that has a little plunger on the front, a little bubble that you hit with your thumb, <clears throat> and that will pump gasoline into the carburetor. It'll make it much more likely to start. Modern saws also have this wonderful thing. When a piston <clears throat> is pushing into place, it's compressing air and fuel. And that compression is quite a lot of pressure. So you, it gets pretty hard to pull the starter. So modern saws have a decompression button. This is a button that simply lets that pressure get released until the engine fires. 
So you want to see whether your saw, the saw you're trying to buy has one of those. These old saws never did have them. So you need to have quite a bit of muscle, and you also had to have your foot on it, because if your foot wasn't on it and you pulled, it just yanked the saw up into the air. <laughs> so that was a, a, an uncomfortable thing to have to put up with. So a decompression button is certainly something to look for <clears throat> in a new saw. So we've eliminated what's on the outside of the saw, and it's still not running. So now what we need to do is go into the carburetor. So we <clears throat> get in there. Take off the cover, take off the filter, <clears throat> take off the two screws that hold the carburetor in place. And these saws uh, have been copying each other for so long that they're, all, they're fairly comparable. Even different brands will be pretty much the same. So down go these two bolts. There is <clears throat> the trigger that moves the uh, throttle is usually a slightly bent rod. So all you need to do is unbend it, just give it a little twist, and free it. The choke is also a rod, often with a cotter pin on it. You take the cotter pin off, and you always do this in the woods where there are lots of leaves and the wind's blowing and raining and whatever. Put it there where it won't fall off <clears throat> and get lost. And then the only thing left that's holding it is the line that goes back to the carburetor. So you pop that off, and here's the carburetor. Carburetors are basically a sandwich. <clears throat> Think of a ham sandwich, a piece of bread on one side, piece of bread on the other, and ham in the middle. So we want to go to the bottom of the carburetor. That's where the fuel came in. So we turn this thing upside down so that we're looking at the bottom. And <clears throat> we will take off. Often they will have a final filter. So there's this little filter here. There it is. This is a little <clears throat> stainless steel screen filter. And being stainless steel, it doesn't rust. But it often has a bunch of stuff on it that you want to clean off. And in this case, the cover that held it in place was just a piece of steel. If I look at that, there's rust all over it. And <clears throat> that's because of the water that's in the gas. And that rust flakes off and gets deeper into the carburetor and, of course, clogs it up and it won't run. Next, we want to get to the valves in the carburetor. There is a, the first piece of bread in the sandwich is held on with a number of screws. Uh, I've seen four, six, and eight screws doing that job. One of the experiences I had way back when <clears throat> I was up in Quebec cutting uh, uh, pulpwood. These are four foot log pieces of wood. And I was in the Laurentians near the, uh, some kind of ski resort where the Americans came up to ski. And I was cutting <clears throat> all day long with my bucking saw. It's just a hand saw <clears throat> back and forth. It was nice, beautiful, quiet. And I enjoyed that very much. And this guy comes skiing along and uh, <clears throat> he's lost. And he says, uh, what you doing? <clears throat> and uh, I said in my French accent, well, I am cutting the cord wood wood. And he said, boy, that looks like really hard work. Why don't you go see my brother down in Portland, Maine? He's got this store where he sells a much better saw than that. So <clears throat> I thought about it for a couple months and then got on the train and went to Portland <clears throat> and bought uh, this saw. And I went back into the Laurentians and I used it for about a month. And uh, I found that it didn't cut the way my handsaw did. So I took it back and I put it on the counter and I said, it just is not working. And he said, oh really? Well, let's see what's going on. <clears throat> he put it on the, on the counter and he grabbed something on the side of it and pulled it and the saw went blah, 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 blah. Scared the hell out of me. Some of you will get it tomorrow. So here we are. taking the first piece of bread off, and that reveals the valves. Now, what in the world are the valves for? Well, when fuel is sucked in, when the piston comes down, <clears throat> the fuel is in, but when the piston goes back, it would just squirt it right back into the tank. 
So in order to prevent it from going back into the tank, we have these little valves. The fuel goes by the valve. When it tries to go back, it shuts. And these valves are extraordinarily high tech. They're just a little flap of rubber. So this one happens to have two of them. And what happens here is that when <clears throat> those farmers took those congressmen out to dinner uh, and ethanol was introduced, the ethanol made all of these rubber components brittle. So either they curled up and would no longer flap back, or they became stiff and wouldn't flap at all. So all kinds of work had to get done to make a different kind of rubber that wouldn't be affected uh, uh, as badly. But even today, uh, these things uh, suffer way more than they did when we were using ordinary leaded gasoline. So that's the first thing to check. Are these things still uh, <clears throat> viable? There will be a gasket that just <clears throat> seals the two pieces together. It might not be a bad idea <clears throat> to line these things up in this order that you're taking them apart. Uh, today, of course, you all have these phones that take pictures, so you might as well take pictures of it. We didn't have those back then. Now we take <clears throat> the ham off, the piece in the middle. Put that there, and that reveals the pump. The fuel pump is just this little rubber diaphragm. And <clears throat> this thing has a nasty way of hiding the fact that it's no good. <laughs> so you want to hold it up on a good strong light and just flex it a little bit to see where it's cracked or where there might be a pinhole. If there's the slightest hole in this, it doesn't pump at all. So <clears throat> you would want to replace that. But that, too, is probably not where the problem is. The problem is in the bottom part of the sandwich, the, uh, <clears throat> the other piece of bread. And here, we, we're on the downside of the pump. So the pump is filling this chamber <clears throat> with fuel. And the pump is actually quite good and it will pump more than the, than the uh, chainsaw needs. So there is a device here <clears throat> that stops the fuel from going to the pump when it's full. And <clears throat> that's called the needle valve. And that's where the trouble usually is. So the needle valve is spring-loaded. When it's full, <clears throat> it compresses the spring and shuts. <clears throat> when it starts to get used, it opens up and lets more fuel in. So you want to put your thumb on the spring like that. And then we want to free that valve. It's usually held with a shaft. So put your thumb on that little teeter-totter and slowly release your thumb. Take the teeter-totter off. The teeter-totter is on the spring on one side and on the valve on the other. So put the teeter-totter down there. <clears throat> Take the spring out and don't lose it. I actually lost it, and this came out of a pen to replace it. Now, the one tool that's slightly unusual that I needed for this particular saw was a 5 16 socket. And the man who sold it to me was kind enough to point that out and gave me the socket. And it <clears throat> can remove the valve. So the valve is actually just this little <clears throat> plastic uh, <clears throat> rod, I suppose you could say, that's pointed at one end. And that valve, the point, sits in a little donut, a little seat. Now, those valves used to be made out of metal, and the metal wore. When they changed to nylon, <clears throat> it no longer wore. So the valve seat is always made out of brass <clears throat> so that no spark can take place. And <clears throat> it's just this brass thing that the valve sits in, like that. And the donut is here in the bottom. So you remove the donut, or actually before you remove it, just shine it up to the sun to see whether you can see through it. This is where the problem is. That donut gets clogged with dirt. So you remove that, and you go, put it back on, put the whole thing back together, and you're good to go. And I talked a lot, <clears throat> so it took a long time to do this, but you can do all of this in about five minutes. And you do it right there in the woods and, uh, and put it back together. I'm not going to bore you with putting it back together right now.
There are a couple other little things to be aware of. The carburetor <coughs> sits on top of this little reed valve and the fuel goes through that into the engine. So the reed valve <coughs> has these little reeds just like you have on a clarinet, like that, <coughs> for them, or some other device whose purpose is to speed up the passage of the fuel so that <coughs> the speeding up makes the fuel vaporize so that it's more explosive. The chainsaw is not a very natural place for fuel to explode. When the fuel <coughs> comes into the carburetor on this side, then explodes and comes out the other side, the fuel that comes in has been slightly vaporized by this system here, but it hits a cold cylinder. So it might <coughs> recondense in the cylinder. So it's not unusual for a chainsaw to flood so because the gasoline is not exploding. And the colder the chainsaw is, the more likely it is to uh, flood. So having it warm in the winter before you take it out into the woods is not a bad idea. When you do uh, finally get the chainsaw started, the first thing it will do, of course, is stall. <coughs> so, brum, 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 brum. so you're going to be holding the trigger that gives fuel, and you're also going to be holding the choke that uh, prevents air from coming in. If you prevent air from coming in, more fuel comes in. So at the beginning, engines like a lot of fuel and less air because air cools things down. So what's happening is that the air and get fuel are exploding in here and they're beginning to warm this up. So when you start it, first time it runs for a second. Then you pull it again and it might run for four or five seconds. <clears throat> it might take four or five pulls before it's finally sort of running. Then you slowly let go of the trigger, and what you hope is that it will sit there and go putt, 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 putt. But of course, it rarely does that. <coughs> so you're going to pull the trigger a little bit to have it run, and now you're looking for three important screws. And that chainsaw should present those screws to you so that they're really obvious. And most modern chainsaws don't. They're just incredibly difficult to get to. But this is a professional saw, and the screws are right here. One, two, three. And they have a, uh, a screw head that a screwdriver fits. So modern chainsaws will have these things buried somewhere, and they'll have a special tools that's proprietary, and only theirs works. And of course, you lose that right away, and then you can't do the adjustment. Every day that you use a chainsaw, you need to tune it because they're totally dependent on the amount of oxygen that is in this cubic foot of air. I suppose some of you know that <clears throat> in a cubic foot of air, there's almost no oxygen. It's other stuff, nitrogen and carbon dioxide and so on. So the density of oxygen is very low. And as we burn down all the forests in the world, the ratio of oxygen is dropping dramatically. There's less and less. And one of the problems with our pandemic today is just that, that there's less oxygen in the air. So <clears throat> these little screws will say low, high, and idle. So you go to the idle and screw it in, and all that does is push the gas pedal down a little bit. So you let it go, <clears throat> keep screwing it until the saw will actually run. At that point, it's going putt, 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 but it's not tuned for today. So we're going to go to the low screw, and we're going to turn that screw one way or the other, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> if the saw starts to slow down, you're going the wrong way. So turn it the other way. So the saw will go... As soon as it starts to slow down again, you've gone too far, go back. So you go to where it's going the fastest. So now it's sitting there running really well, so well that the chain is moving. And you don't want the chain to be moving, so now you go back to the idle screw and back it off until it's running without the chain moving. So you now have a saw that is going to be a joy to use that whole afternoon. You'll be able to let go of the trigger and it'll just idle. And then you pull the trigger and it immediately accelerates. If when you pull the trigger it dies for a second, like, <coughs> instead of <coughs> then you, you have screwed it a little bit too far. So screw it slightly back so that the second you pull the trigger it immediately accelerates. Then we have the high screw, and this is the right mixture of air to fuel <coughs> at uh, full power. And the way I do this is that I take the saw and I set it into a log, pull the trigger all the way, and it's sawing. 
So this thing is madly moving around, <coughs> and somehow I get my screwdriver onto that screw, and I move it back and forth. And what I'm looking for there is the highest pitch scream I can get. If I'm getting a Harley Davidson rumble, brrr, that's awful. That is no power whatsoever. You want it to scream like a banshee. So just go back and forth until you get that, that scream. And that whole process takes about 30 seconds. So in 30 seconds, you've got a saw that's going to run like a dream all that afternoon. Since the atmosphere changes constantly, the next day you'll have to do a minor adjustment uh, <coughs> to accommodate the uh, oxygen content. Hey there, thank you for watching. Here at Shelter Institute in Woolwich, Maine, we teach a wide variety of house building and timber framing and carving classes. We'd love to see you here, but if you can't make it to Maine to take one of our classes, our online class is available at shelterinstitute.com.